Good evening. Thanks to God. I'm going to have Brother Christian watch with us today. You turn to hymn number 17. Turn my family. Hymn number 17. Before the congregation to 
judgment, and until the death of the high priest, it shall be in those days. Then shall the slayer return and come unto his own city, and unto his own house, unto the city from whence he fled. And they appointed Kadesh and Galilee and Mount Nephali and Shechem and Mount Ephraim and Kirjotha and in Hebron in the mountain of Judah. And on the other side, Jordan by Jericho, Easter, they assigned Bezer in the wilderness upon the plain, out of the tribe of Reuben and Ramoth and Gilead. Out of the tribe of Gad and Golan, and based in out of the tribe of Manasseh. These were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel, and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. That whosoever fell of any person at unawares might flee thither and not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. Our most gracious Lord, we thank you for providing our refuge from sin in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the constant blessings you bestow on us. Lead us in your ways, Lord. We need your constant guidance. Lord, be our refuge, our sanctuary, our ark for the protection of our souls. We are all sinners in need of a refuge which you have provided for your son's sacrifice on the cross. Through the blood we are saved from the wrath of God. Oh, to be safe in Christ, safe in the sanctuary, safe in the ark of him who saves souls and sinners. We pray for those of our congregation that in sickness and strife, trials and sorrows. Be with all of us, Lord, and stay to guide us along the path. Conform us, Lord, to the image of your Son. Be our strength and consolation until we join you in the glory. Give our brother Mary the strength and clarity to proclaim the gospel of truth tonight. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Turn to him 127. 126. <laughs> Thank you. 
Somewhere in my mind, about exactly right there. Uh, good to be with you. Always is. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me back, even if it's not the fifth time. Be all right. Lord willing, you won't see me on the fifth time. Uh, but it's been a, it's always a pleasure. Uh, I, I'm home. I'm home. But it's always a good one. The handsome, smart. And especially with you, they just treat us. They couldn't do, couldn't do it anymore, couldn't do it anymore. And what they do is just, uh, we feel so comfortable, so at home. And, uh, and that would be not good, I'm sure, if you know. But uh, that's the uh, problem I'm going to say. All right, would you turn with me to First Peter, chapter 2. First Peter, chapter 2, we'll read it. Together, the first ten verses. First Peter two. Hmm. Wherefore, laying aside all mouth and all guile and hypocrisy and envies and all evil speaking. As the newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow there by a gift, so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom come, always come, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house. And holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, 
I lay in thine a chief cornerstone. He led, pray. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. And to you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. When I got up pretty early this morning, turned on the coffee pot, sat down in the living room at Mark and Virginia's home, opened my phone, the first thing in the inbox of my mail caught my eye from Grace Jeans. That's a site, uh, if you're not aware of it, it's a very good site. But uh, the reading for this morning was from Brother Don Ford. And uh, let me just read a sentence to you. Let us pray as we open the scriptures, Don Lord. Let us pray. O oh, Spirit of God, open this book to my heart, and open my heart to this book. That's a good prayer. I hope we're praying it right now. Take the things of Christ written upon these pages and show them to me. Our text is verse 3, here in 1 Peter 2. If so be, if so be, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Psalm 34, from which Peter probably referred with uh, in verse 3, it says in Psalm 34 and 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. That is, try for yourself. Taste for yourself. Try and experience for yourself that God is gracious. God is gracious. The title of this message is A Taste for Grace. A Taste for Grace. It was probably a month or so ago. I was sitting uh, in the waiting area while I was having my car service going to the pocket. Been going there ever since I moved there almost 13 years ago. Almost 13 years ago, now I'm just done. But uh, a man that I had seen there many times walked in and he sat down next to me. And uh, we began to chat, and of course, he knows I'm a pastor. And he asked me some irrelevant question. <laughs> and, and I told him, I've never thought of that. I mean, I, I just never, he asked me what he did. He I said, I've never given that a thought. And uh, I said, by the way, wh- where do you attend church? And he said, well, I don't. I don't. He said, that. I had a bad experience in the church uh, years ago, so I don't go anywhere anymore. He was, I think, about 75 years old. Uh, I suspect that bad experience probably 50 or 60 years ago. But that's why, that's the reason he gave for not attending. So I invited him to our church. And he said, no, I won't do it. And I said, uh, I'll pull out my phone. I said, would you be interested in listening in the privacy of your, your home of the messages I preach at our church plus a whole lot of other men? And of course, the Free Grace, Free Grace website. And uh, at first he said no. And then Rex, I think he did it just to make me feel better, which is what he did. He said, I go ahead and do it. Uh, I hope he listens to, he listens to it. Uh, but it made me realize, once again, once again, that only God Almighty can make a sinner thirsty with the water of life. Isn't that so? Only God can, can create in a sinner's heart a hunger for that grace that only comes through Jesus Christ. We can't do it for our children. 
We can't do it for our loved ones. We couldn't do it for ourselves. Only God and His majestic grace can give you a appetite, a hunger, and a thirst for grace. And I was also reminded after talking with that man of another thing that only God's free grace gave me a hunger for grace that allowed me to taste, as Peter exhorts me, allowed me to taste for my sin God's grace and that He is grace. Peter begins and ends this epistle to these suffering believers. And you're probably aware of what was happening when he wrote both of these epistles, first and second Peter. Uh, God's people have been falsely accused of burning Rome. You, you, you probably heard of that. And they blamed it on the Christians. We wrote, had to have a scapegoat. And man, they, every conceivable way they could think of, they used them as entertainment uh, in the arena, the feet, feet of the lions. Uh, Nero even dipped them in tar and used them as human torches to light his garden. They would go through the streets behind chariots. Now, that's, that's the circumstances that these people were in that Peter wrote this official to. It's no wonder that Peter begins in his letter and ends his letter in the very same way. It's grace, 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 grace. And that's true throughout the Word of God. Look, at, if you will, at verse 2 of chapter 1. First Peter 1 and 2. He writes to these pilgrims, these strangers, scattered, scattered everywhere. But he said, he left, he left. Nero can't touch this. He can't change it. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace. Oh, can you imagine how they stood, what great need they had of God's peace. Everything around them was falling apart. In the world, the Master said to his disciples, in the world, and this good for you and I today, in the world ye shall have tribulation. There is no getting around it. But be of good cheer. Peace, he said. My peace. The peace we just read. My peace. I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not like the world. Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Grace unto you and peace be mine. And throughout this letter, this first letter, epistle, and second epistle, Peter reminds them over and over again of this blessed reality. Not a fairy tale, not a fable. Not a fiction of someone's imagination. He reminds them of the blessed reality that God's grace, God's amazing grace, God's reigning grace, God's sovereign grace, God's free grace, is never subtracted. It's never divided. It's always multiplied. That's true of every child of God who's ever been called out of darkness into His marvelous light, no matter what time, when. They live in this world. Grace is always multiplied. One hymn writer put it this way, and you, you're familiar with this. He giveth more grace as our burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength as our labors increase. The added afflictions, he added his mercy. The multiplied trials, he multiplies too. Is that not so? Is, in, is there the, every believer here tonight, every believer throughout this world at this hour can say amen to that. God's grace has never failed. Has ne- not one time. Has it? Of course not. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto me. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he gives us, and he gives us, and he gives us again. Child of God, hasn't that been your experience? Robin and I yesterday went to do what we always try to when we're here, visit 
they were in very good. We probably spent an hour and a half or two hours with them yesterday. And of course, dear Betty continued to decline. Uh, we spoke with her, and we went in, and we left, had prayer. If she was aware of it, I couldn't tell her. But uh, as I said, she continues to decline. And each time I see her, I think God will soon take her home. She's going to be somewhere soon. And her dear, faithful husband continues to be 24 7 a constant caregiver. Please remember him before the song of God. Remember, we got it. Uh, but I thought of these, these words while I was in that home. And Robin and I talked about it after we got Peter wrote, I'm sorry, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6. And whether one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members in the people. I told dear day, because it's taken a total long I mean, it would end. And uh, but I told him, I said, Dave, you are a testament. You are a constant testimony. You have been to me, and I'm sure that everyone knows you. You're a testimony to the sufficiency of God's amazing grace. You're a testimony to the sufficiency of God's grace. As the Lord told the Apostle Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. How about that? For my strength is made perfect in weakness, most gladly possible. Most gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest upon me. And I reminded him of this promise from that one who has loved him and his dear wife and all of his will be doing with an everlasting love. The prophet Isaiah 49, Sing O Heaven. Sing, O heaven, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, ye mountains. For the Lord has comforted his people, and will have mercy upon his afflicted. But Zion said, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. Who is God's response? Can a woman forget her certain child? That she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, yea. They may forget, yet will not I forget thee. Can it happen? Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Peter, again in this letter in the second, begins and ends with grace. What better message for these suffering believers? That grace of God was always flowing through the Lord Jesus Christ to His leading people. He ends his epistle with these words. By Sabinus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly exhorting and testifying, this is the true grace of God were in you stand. That's first Peter five and four. This is the true grace of God. I mean, without a doubt, the devil whispered in the ears of these poor believers. Uh, ones who hadn't lost their life and lost their property were chased from their homes, filled with these strangers here as addresses them as what better message to be reminded of that you're standing in the true grace of God. Huh? Nero can't take you off that. You're on a foundation which cannot be shaken. That stands sure. Nero can't do anything about that. As a matter of fact, his hatred, his hatred, his vengeance, his lies are only used by our sovereign God to usher his people in the world. How about that? This is the true grace of God we're in you sing. First, how can I know? How can I know that that's true? 
that I'm standing in the true grace of God. That I'm standing in, I'm trusting the true grace of God. I've tasted His grace for myself. I'm usually standing in the pulpit of Fairmont Grace Church in Philadelphia, Alabama. Tonight, I'm standing in the pulpit of Grace Baptist Church, Church in Danville, Kentucky. But am I in Christ? Hmm? I'm in the right doctrine. I'm convinced of that. But I could do that and not be in Christ. Am I in Christ? For example, I believe and rejoice in the blessed, glorious truth that Jesus Christ obtained eternal redemption for His people. It's a done deal. It didn't depend on anything would be done by us in time. It was done, it was effectual at the time he offered himself to God without spot. And I love that thing. I rejoice in it. I find comfort. Man, I lie down at night. If I look back over the day, Bill, my soul, I couldn't, I couldn't begin to calculate how many times in the day since I opened my eyes this morning that I sinned against my God. That I forgot my God. That my mind has wandered out into this world, as well as my heart sometimes. Aren't you thankful that your eternal redemption, your salvation doesn't depend on you? We be insufferable. No, he obtained our eternal redemption. He laid down his life for his sheep. That's true whether people like it or not. In other words, redemption was a particular redemption. An effectual redemption. There's no question about that. But do I know the reading? I can know the doctrine. But do I know the redeemer that redeemed his people, Jesus Christ himself? In the second epistle of Peter, in chapter 2, verses, uh, verse 10, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 1, verse 10. Peter wrote this, this, this second letter to these suffering believers, Second Peter 1 and 10. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence, give diligence, give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. Your calling, your election, not somebody else, not Sandy Wall, no. God says, Mary, you make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. I want to share with you two statements about two of God's faithful messengers that we all knew and heard preached so many times. They preached the glorious gospel that consumed God's son. Brother Don Ford. And Brother Henry Mayhem. Faithful men now in glory. And we've known many other faithful men that preach the glorious gospel of God. The first brother done, from a message he preached on First Peter, from First Peter, rather, chapter 1, the first ten verses. But this is how he began his message. This was the introduction. If I remember right when I read it, I it, it didn't mind me, but uh, this is what he said. This will ring a bell. You can you can say amen to this. That's exactly what he did. But he, he, he said, It is the salvation of your immortal souls that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about earthly, temporal things, but about spiritual, eternal things. I'm not talking about your house, your property, your money, your health. I'm not talking to you about politics, history, or even church dogma. I'm talking to you about something of real importance. I'm talking to you about the soul. Mm. Mm. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And God wrote, salvation, real salvation, causes saved sinners to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, doesn't this sound just like him? <laughs> I'm not talking about giddy, giggly, ha-ha, he-he joy. I'm talking about real joy. 
Joy in the very depths of your heart. Joy. Joy in God your Savior. When we have nothing else in which to rejoice, we can and should rejoice in our Lord God and His great salvation. Doesn't that sound for me? <laughs> Brother Henry Mayhem, he said, anyone who is serious, not like the man I encountered in the garage, but anyone who is serious about a knowledge of in relationship with the living God ought to question today's religion, which makes salvation only a profession and not an experience. God's grace must be experienced. And received by faith, and he wrote, I'll never get across the river by simply believing that a certain bridge can take me across or that others have been successful in using the bridge. I must experience the bridge's deliverance and power for myself. As Peter exhorts, taste and see for yourself a taste for grace. And that brings us to our second thought. Our text gives us the answer to that question. How can I know that I'm standing in the true grace of God? Have I experienced? Have I tasted? Is it become a part of me? Is that not what he told the woman at the well? I'll give you a drink and it'll be a spring within you, springing up into everlasting life. As newborn babes, verse 2 here of chapter 1, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 2 and verse 2. Verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. And God's people will desire the sincere milk of the word. And Peter says, If you will, you will, if you have, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Has God created in me a taste? But is, do I have an appetite? It is great that I experienced it. Listen to these words of our Lord Jesus Christ. I quoted a verse from this conversation that he had with that woman at the well. But listen to this from John 4. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest, and she knew some things, he began to, you know, she got nervous because he was putting his finger on the sword spot so he, he brought out her fig leaf. He wasn't impressed. He busted him aside. And he said, Lady, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that says to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest ask of him, and he would have given thee living water. Whosoever, he said, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but, but, <laughs> oh, if God gives you a taste and appetite for grace, that only grace will satisfy. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, shall never thirst. If thou knew, that's the question is, do I know who it is that speaks through his written word? Do I know this one who is the incarnate God? Hmm? Christ praying to his heavenly Father says, Father, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou did send. Do I know this one who is the incarnate God? That one, that eternal God, has pretty much more than my little P.V. Wayne can pass. But that word that was with God was God. They created all things that are. That one who was made flesh, that word, that very breath expression of God, was made flesh and dwelt among us. Wow. You said, if you, if you can answer, you can tell me how that could be, or if you know how that can be, you tell me. <laughs> I just bow to him on and say, like we think, hallelujah, what a Savior. Do I know this one who comes to his elect? When they're dead and trespasses in sin and raise, raises them up to newness of life, and they say, Wow, behold, all things, old things that are passed away, and everything, everything becomes good. I'm seeing things through a different set of eyes than I ever did before. Oh, this world, which was once all I ever cared about. 
all I spent my energy for. I wiped my feet on it because now I press for the mark of the calling of the high of the prize of the high calling of God. I read for Jesus Christ. Oh, suffering believer, look what's waiting at the finish line. The captain of our salvation himself. In other words, Christ said, Lady, are you thirsty? I know everything about you. I know you've got some religion. I'm not interested in that. Are you thirsty? No one has ever, oh, here's, here's, here's this is no one has ever, ever really thirsted for grace that God didn't create that first thirst in them. It's against human nature. It's, it's just not in fallen Adam. Never. Remember who the Lord spoke these words to? Many, many of the multitude that actually partook in John 6 is where I'm thinking of. What was it? 5,000 men besides the women and children? I mean, these people sat down, they watched him take those few fishes and loaves and feed 16,000 people. I mean, they weren't just observers standing by. They sat down and actually ate the bread and the fish. And then our Lord left. And many of them, perhaps thousands, they came looking for him. When they saw that he wasn't there where he had fed them, they came looking for him. And when they found him, this is what Jesus Christ said to them. Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the most and were filled. Labor not for that meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures unto life everlasting, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father filled. Jesus said in that conversation, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. Once he tastes my grace, he that believes on me shall never, never thirst. And you remember what happened. What well, sure you do. What was wrong with these people? They turned on their heels and said, we will not listen to him anymore. You know why? They had a hunger for natural bread. They got hungry. That's the only reason they stopped Christ. And when he said, you've not really come to me. You can't come to me unless God, my Father, draws you to me. They turned around and walked to me. Doesn't that sound familiar? They had a hunger, but not for grace. They didn't want that bread that came down from heaven, Jesus Christ himself. They had no appetite for that. No hunger, no thirst, no desire for that. That's not what they came for. Not for the bread of life, but for natural bread. I think it was two or three weeks ago, you had three weeks. He preached from a couple weeks ago from the song about the pit. And I listened to some of much as I could because I was getting ready uh, myself, but on my piece. So y'all know who it is. I'm having this in the moment. Perhaps y'all don't know. Y'all are here. <laughs> but I was watching it on my PC. Who was it? That's David. Uh, thank you, sir. Luke Carter. He would have come to me by 9 o'clock tonight. <laughs> but all he had is a great message. It caught my attention. He talked about sinners being in a pit. Where are we? We're in the pit. He said, how are we going to get out? <laughs> I told Robin, that, that's a great outline. But while I was... Uh, Looking at it on my laptop, laptop. I know, you know how that is. I'm listening to y'all's live stream today. And uh, right here on the right, this caught my attention. Here's this fellow, looks like something out of the 60s or 70s, a hippie looking fellow. And he said he had this title under his picture The Immense Weight of Plain Jesus. I guess he was some nutty actor. Maybe that's a TV show or something. And then under that one was another one. An Air Force vet dies and meets Jesus and was given the power to heal. Hmm. 
And then there was another one, Holy Mass in honor of Our Lady of Fatima. I can pronounce that word, that mama or something. Uh, on the anniversary of her, of her aberration in 2023. Wow. It reminded me that last time. One time I was talking to my mother and my baby sister, who now has four, four uh, sons, married to Catherine. All that. But uh, when the first son graduated, they had his uh, uh, graduation service at some big cathedral. Uh, there, she, she lives in Virginia and worked at the Pentagon, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, Mom was telling me about it. She said, you know where it is? Where you see it on TV? It's the TV. It's, one, it's where one of those Supreme Court justices that had his funeral. I said, hey, right, Mom, what was the name of the place? Mom said, and just there's a heart attack. I think it was the Church of the Holy Mind. <laughs> I said, well, why not? <laughs> what difference does it make? <laughs> But when I saw these things on the side of the brother preaching the glorious gospel of God's grace, I couldn't help but wonder how many people would rather feed on that garbage than to feed on the bread of life that that brother was preaching about God's dear Son, the only name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. In John chapter 7, our Lord said this, after for seven or eight days watching a feast of the Jews, watching them go through the motions, the traditions, he observed. He observed that day. You can read it in John chapter 7. Here are those words. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, cried, saying, Are you listening? If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. I don't know if anybody who in that vast multitude of Jews going through religious tradition. And there is the water of life right before them saying, Is anybody thirsty? I don't read in that chapter that anybody came to Perhaps they did. And that was the problem, wasn't it? The same as today. They weren't thirsty. People had an appetite for a little religion, a little religious spasm, but not thirsty for the water of life. Not hungry for the bread of life until God in grace makes them so. And aren't you glad he did you? Well, if he had made, made you hungry and thirst after righteousness, you never would have. If he hadn't had drawn you, you would have never came to him. The true believer not only goes into the vineyard and sees the wine, he also goes into the wine cellar and tastes the wine. And this <laughs> oh, nothing like his grace. Listen to what the psalmist said. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. When's the last time you talked to somebody with that? My soul thirsted for God, the living God. The living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Psalm 63. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsted for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. I don't think such a man as that would be satisfied, cutting up an owl, and making a decision for you. <laughs> it just wouldn't do I want to know God. God's created in me a thirst that only God can give me the water that I never thirst to give me. Thank God that He would not allow you, believer, or me, to be satisfied with anything less. He won't do it. Look, thank God He won't do it. Oh, when He when He makes you thirsty, He's not playing games. He's not tantalizing you. He's made you thirsty, so you'll call out to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and oh Lord, let me taste Your grace. Be gracious unto me. How did old Newton express it? 
Oh, this race has taught my heart to fear. Why? Because if it didn't, I would have never known my name. And God did that, but He didn't stop there. And that same grace relieved that fear. That same wondrous grace relieved that fear. Oh, do you remember? Do you remember? Sure you do. You remember what a relief that was? <laughs> Sure you do. You remember that? What a relief that was. Remember the fear. Remember the torment. Remember the anguish. Perhaps like me, people directed you to everything but Christ, the altars and the decisions. Randy told me to get a haircut. All these things. Oh, but but when I lay in bed and couldn't sleep, God have mercy. I didn't know the word or not. He didn't have to. I deserved the opposite of mercy, but he had taught my heart to fear so that I would cry out for mercy. And oh, what a relief it was. <laughs> oh, my soul. What a relief it was when King Jesus said, Merry Christmas, thy sins, which are many, are all forgiven to me. Wow. What a relief. <laughs> oh, what a relief that was. Thank God that if He's created a hunger and thirst in your soul, for Him. Again, Psalm 38, 34 and 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. You remember that woman, I think I referred to it the Sunday morning, with that issue of blood. We read that she had spent all of her living on many positions and was not any better, but rather grew worse. That's what religious Christ do. That's what these fellows that say you take the first step and God will take the rest. They lying religious Christ. They may think it's so, but it's not so. You don't come to Jesus with your feet. Ask that multitude that got hungry and came searching for them. Oh, she suffered, suffered so many things. Oh, but what happened? What happened? What happened just like that? When she touched the hem of the garment of the great physician, hmm? there's never a place to hide from him. Robin and I think about, pray for our family, her son, his wife, the Lord is lost, grandchildren, same on my side. And then we get discouraged, and I said, Oh, honey, remember, nothing's too hard. We can't get those things. They won't listen to us. But if he says, Come down, sinner, they're going to fall down in the dust, and they're going to cry for mercy, just like Saul the Prophet. That's encouraging, isn't it? Christ gives an appetite for himself, which we never had before, and we long for his gifts. Uh, let, 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 let me. Let me get on down here. A good old friend speaks of this first to know the living God, to know his son for my spirit, not by processing out these people, repeating, learning words I heard somebody else say, but to know his son, to taste his grace for my spirit. In our church, our little flock, for oh, a good while now. We've been using the uh, CDs, Dear uh, Brother Dave, oh, um, Judy, Judy Estes, uh, uh, Virginia gave me David, uh, David Edmondson today, and I'm now listening to some of that, so we'll, we'll be using that, but this one is by Brother, you stay the Lord, stay calm. Oh, God, just to come on. All my life long, I've come for a glass from Prince to explain that I hope the Prince to burn of the first I felt with him. Feeding on the husk around me, remember that? Till my strength was almost gone, long my soul for something better. And he still the hunger man. Sounds like the one who created, God had created a hunger and a thirst in that soul. For I was and sought for riches, something that would satisfy, but the dust I gathered around me only mocked. My soul's sad cry. I don't know. 
well of water every spring, bread of life so rich and free, untold wealth that never fails. My Redeemer is in it. Hallelujah, I have found <laughs> Who my soul so long has prayed, Jesus satisfies my longing. Through his blood, I now am saved. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is great. The church not only enters the vineyard, oh, but it partakes of the sweet grapes of his grace. Shelby, this morning, I've been thinking at it every time I'm here. My poor brother, too. So she invited me, Robin, to breakfast. Oh, my. That sure did bring back memories I'm sure to breakfast. Don, that rascal, you know what he used to do? He would call me up. And he would say, Larry, guess what I'm having for supper? Shelby speaks to me one of her breakfast is something. And you know how Don was. He started his pattern. Oh, Larry, he said. Sure wish you were here. We're having sausage and that gravy and biscuits. Hey. Oh, I, I wish you were here. He knew I was 400 miles away. But I did not Oh, but I did have meal of four good groceries, good groceries. I often wish that I was in with the LD two minutes away, and he would call and tell me that, and I'd be knocking on the door. <laughs> but, uh, child of God, you notice what the text says? As wondrous as God's grace is, it's only a text. That's amazing. His marvelous, wondrous grace is only a taste of what's in store for every child of God. What a joy it is to experience the riches of God's grace here below, but it's only a taste compared to the everlasting state of Christ when we sat down at the table of our Lord in glory. Christ feeds all of His people with grace overflowing from His throne of grace now until He brings them to glory. For as often as we eat the bread, this bread, Paul wrote in some of the Lord's Supper, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will show the Lord's death till He comes. After that, you won't need it. You won't need a reminder. You'll see Him as He is and be right. Then grace will step aside and we'll end the glory. <laughs> oh, yes. That's kind of bogged my mind. I mean, but that's what he said. This is just a taste. A taste of grace. Great things he has taught. Great things he has done. And great are rejoicing through Jesus the Son. Oh, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus is saved. When I was a young boy at home, so at home, we were all uh, heard about the house. And that was the last time we were all together. My brother was 17 years old, my oldest brother, and he joined the Navy. But uh, when we were still all at home, they still left eight of us kids. But I had four brothers and four, four sisters, and my, my dear old father, he, uh, he never had a job that paid very much money. Uh, so when we sat down to eat, there never was a second help in the bathroom. <laughs> we took care of that the first time. But in my father's house, in my father's house above, Jesus Christ has already prepared a place at the table for every one of his children. But God chose in him before the foundation of the world. When all the redeemed are with their glorious redeemed, when all are under the same roof in the father's house, Jesus Christ invites each individual in that vast multitude to sit down with him at his table in glory. Oh, what a banquet. What a banquet of rich things. What a banquet. I'll be satisfied. Rich, I don't desire nothing that I won't have. I'll never crave anything. It'll all be there. 
at the table of our elder brother, William Gustin, a preacher of oh, many years ago, and you've probably heard this book. But he visited, he was a pastor, and one day he visited a dying woman, one of, who was ignorant of the gospel and unconverted at the time. Guthrie preached the gospel to her, and she joyfully believed God granted that woman faith before he left. Before he left, the woman died. When he got home, he told his family, I've seen a strange thing today. A woman whom I found in a state of nature, I saw in a state of grace, and left in a state of glory. <laughs> a taste of grace is a certain prelude to glory hereafter. Children of God, won't that be something? Come and die. Come and die. All this is for you. <laughs> God bless you. talking about how well fed he's been since he's been here. Y'all been the gentleman. I feel as well fed as you can. From Sunday into day, well, I, I am well fed. So I'll enjoy it. Enjoy you being here. Enjoy you expounding God's Word to you. Bunch of hungry things. Thank you, brother. We love you and appreciate you coming. Let's do this mission prayer, please. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father. Thank you for gathering us here tonight, gathering here with us in your presence. Servant Larry, preach your word to us. Oh Lord, let us soak this in tonight as we lay in our beds. Let us soak this message of grace into our heart. Lord, we so appreciate you bringing him here for us. Lord, be with him as he travels. Bring him back again, please. Feed us again, Father. Father, be with us. Help us pray for each other. Teach us how to pray, Lord. We do not know how to pray. What to pray for. You know our wants and you know our needs. Help us to understand your will. Pray that your will will be done in all things. Lord, this grace is filled in the name of God. Amen. What I was getting ready to say. <laughs> you will read my, Rex will be bringing the message Sunday. Pray for him. And Larry will be a hurricane road if you didn't hear that. And the Lord will and pray for his faith travels and a message to those folks there and that. And then he'll be going to back home a little bit, I believe. West Virginia. Larry, thank you, buddy. We appreciate you. Good to see you.